we're not going to take a break now, but while I'm talking is a good time to <laughs> <laughs> leave and come back. Uh, we have two more readers uh, tonight. Uh, this is um, being webcast, so welcome to the final section of North of Invention, A, <laughs> Canadian Poetry Festival. When uh, Jeff, a lot of people are taking me up <laughs> on that suggestion. <laughs> when Jeff uh, asked, <laughs> when Jeff said we are the um, agents of moral change, in the world, I wondered what he meant by we, <laughs> thinking of us here in the US, and I wanted to assure you guys that if you don't destroy the environment, we sure will. So you don't have to worry about it. Um, Lisa Robertson was born in Toronto and has spent much of her life in Vancouver where she's been an active participant in artist run organizations including uh, Art Speak Gallery and the Kootenai School of Writing. Her books include Debbie and Epic, Magenta Soul Whip and R's Boat, which is just out from the University of California Press. Uh, those books, or some of those books, as well as the books of many of the other participants here are available for sale just outside there, and I hope you all get a chance to look at those books and uh, to buy them. Um, over the last um, decade, as Lisa Robertson's work has become better known, she's become one of the most compelling and necessary poets writing in North America, as you will know from hearing her talk today, the intricacy, originality, and force of her work is unexcelled. It's my great pleasure to welcome Lisa Robertson to the Kelly Writers House. That's an awesome introduction. <laughs> I feel like I should have tripped and fallen over on the way up, and I sort of did. <laughs> um, I've just decided that I'm going to read two poems, um, both out of um, my last book, Lisa Robertson's Magenta Soul Whip, beautifully designed by the Canadian artists um, Hadley and Maxwell. This is what it looks like. I'm very happy with it. In, in fact, I'll just, how much time do I have? 15 minutes? Something like that. I just stand here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah that's, okay, that, that's all I have to say. <laughs> Two poems. Early education. I designed my own passivity. I present it to you by my face, by your guts, and in the name of human space. I was born into a rough little city, site of hasty invention actively dissolving into steel sky. The city was a glittering ruin sucked upwards. Great virtues are numerous, and wisdom has a laughable magnitude. The circumference of a human creature is his own testimonium. Her superb mortal resistance as a creature is a liquid gate. Our hearts are intelligible. To excite and to tempt you, I will relate the ways of my past unhappiness. Should I invoke necessity or fate? 
Komodo item I invoke is unbelievable. All gods are grave gods. What is without predicate? Let's sing to the god who requires it. Let's sing to our enemies also. Querum te invocans te, and I'll invent credens in te. A predicate is a noble enemy, and my fidelity is my own disaster. Inspirasti mihi perfuling human humanitatem with this speech. Another version of the same beginning is simpler and more direct. In the long science of submission, it is the mind that quietly spectacular unhooks the bodies and opens the face. The dominator is cuddled inside me. What would you call that? When we quibble and feast, what would you call that? Since Tua quid quid fades, has faded, this quid quid, that's your name. All that's feral in me, whatever being I am, it eats into my docent. I invoke dominance to undo myself. I had no enemies, no parent, no clock. Dominant, you filled the nurse's tits and so abundantly taught me to sip. I'm telling you about things I don't remember, nothing more, fibbing and sipping, sipping and fibbing, very similar. Et cum non intellectu me obsessit, non subitus indignation, no servitude. Quam scientes is my nutrient. Dominant, qui et semper vivus, and nothing in us, to creasti et really instabilium et immutable. Quam illa intra visceral matrix? Dominant, my soft word, no memoria could have prepared me for your earth. I am the first suckling among multa, your artifice, your animal, gaudy with cries, gaudy with hunger, and lovely with hunger and hunger. Listen to the human's fib. Misery dictates. I remember the fibs of my infancy, a fib per heartbeat cooked by earth. Will this commemorate me? Dominant, do you remember me? My ego's made from milk, abundant fountains of milk, my dominant, my own, which dedicate themselves to the illuminate corpus, instructress of senses, so that I speak to you in the syllables of your name, dominant, and as bonus I make for you a nest of my ordinary thighs, two, forma omnia et legge. Ergo, dominant, for you I have the fidelity of a fox, a piglet, an enemy, a name, Multum, so many fidelities and oblivions, for you are shadow and concept with no memory, no vestige, no need. Remember the undulant speech of your childhood enemy saying, give it, give it, give it. I give it as various vocables and membranes voluntarily like this. I name the liquids and seconds that move the body turning towards memory and emitting sound among its quorum, this turning and opening, this masking, and what gets called humane vita, authors no greater horror. So who possesses the stamina to parent their own sensibility? No brat does, and beneath the school of belts, a language. Its audibility, no refuge no accident. To be coherent is to form enemies. Dominant, I wanted to wear memory like a molded hunger, willing ahead of myself some form of satisfaction or vindicate legendary torment. With what certainty did I console my welts? Though dominant, even my fibs are ordinary as belts, flicking against authority a peccadillo, diligently, diligently unspeakable. 
a kid's weaned on eternal promises and humiliation. Dominant, give me your superb sign so I can use it as a crutch or a rope cast into my pointless fidelity. Yes, Dominant, I'll tell each dilated fib with my dripping tongue as delicious recreation and state my credo of necessity, the tongue like an ego to me, Dominant. Whom shall I serve? Without you for whom welts fatten, I'd be minus agency, minus glory, minus number, my author who cuddles me insatiably. My soul's bulky with you as it is bulky with fibs. Whatever the cause of the grace of dogs, the do soft odor of books, the quibbling of kids, it's unbearable. No docent knows such grammar, nor am I parsed, me, a vain wreath of milk, vanity itself, caro factum, quia certiones, non spiritus ambulance, and islands of written stuff, a vast itinerary of errors, as I died upwards towards you, vita mia, like a magnet, sure, like girls die of fierce love and freezes commemorate the fierce cords of light that are their souls and soldiers eat sponge cake and I don't love you and I fornicate towards you singing down, down and it is the solemn world I pull against my tummy, down, down and no fierce extreme sedates me, no sequence of the lips and teeth say nothing of the soul that flutters its sleeve dictating not this not that not this muddled doctrine i'll not name each oblivion each venal carthage each dumb rut written up in verse dominant my ink's not diligent like yours i simply tug and vend and strum at pacts Secundum signa quibbling literis incommodo. Sit, poetica, stupid with words, past their sweet arsed date. It is the difficult tally of my tongue to admit that such songs and those of puerile docents stroked my milky ego. Dominant, may I call you Rex now and feed you tidbits? My heart calls you Rex because you are my first part. As Rex, I'll serve you what are called tidbits, and each locution and scribble and number just adores you, Rex. What is vanity is really your discipline. For vanus peccata deluctum multa, for the rest of my life to please you, I won't fib, Rex, I promise. And towards what illusion, my little Rex, do I tighten the cord that is my ink and adulate everything sentient? Rex, my pet, what is suspended between us is sewn of figura. Who can resist a human who doesn't finger lies? A word's a precious vase to sip from, an illicit verb. Both kids and scholars sip there, the sweet lubricity spilling over tongue. And Rex, I sipped also. I can safely say this now, since I sip from you. No other figment, no other persona, no other sentence. Rex, what is suspended between us? The soldier reaches from behind the falling man's neck to grasp his snout. He is becoming a horned animal. About 1836, an essay on boredom. I met a dog who collected doubt until doubt offered a repose. 
I met a dog who displayed as love a surplus of inactivity. A surplus of inactivity. I asked the dog what I should do about believing. Nothing, he replied. He was the dog of latinity and non-knowledge. Tacit dog, I said, tell me about boredom. The dog replied. At the edges of the villages of Europe, there is boredom. The villages of Europe don't want your thinking. They want not a world. In these villages, one rereads the soiled timetables of minor trains and finds therein grace. This is called an environment. Now you weep its surplus. Nowhere is like that. And the dog said, I am going to call it hegemony <laughs> when waking life feels like purchasing water. On animality, I'll claim, I wanted to go right out over wordlessness until it became a fabric and then to lick it gravely. At the same time, I was chagrined and the social gadgetry hissed. The outside spread without is the village. The outside spread within is boredom. We are often mistaken about origins against which we animals sleep. So I became a collector of things, ideas perhaps, smoothing them in the privacy of my ennui, my studio, I mean, as they smooth their waning orchids. Genially, I am an object. In my canine memory, things gently combine. The glitter, the champagne, the sky blue boudoirs distributed across a surface. They would change, but nothing would change. Ever, ever, ever. Time had no measure other than enjoyment and boredom. Simple bodies in combinations made types, one suffocating, one airy, one narcotic. There was an illegible relation to materiality, and this was mistaken for orthodoxy. But the orthodoxy did not replace the transcendent. In its radical ether flew some dandiacal cravat. One must withdraw for a long time to arrive at the minimum, at the cosmological minimum. It takes an inhuman patience to make the erotic into itself. By cosmology, I mean out in the shadows, out at the edge of the parking lot, just beyond the signage and beyond the erotic even, one's relationship to utopia is elegiacal. Time there is other time. Forget the nostalgia for singularity. The dismantling of hegemony begins with boredom. If just a single one of the new sciences had been sacrificed to the livid boulevards, one of which extends from the era of Greek philosophy to the advent of Christianity, and the boulevard itself a mobile village, and so it is with our own past, late autumn, low Latin. The history of the use of boredom remains latent. One's strategies, how should I put this, used up knowing. I wanted to feel discourse on my pelt. 
But all I could see was theology's iced hips contra the use of the present. Not will they welcome the concept, not the concept, that being what one usefully does against loneliness. Whereas we in the villages, we must share our nightingales. Somebody brackets their body and somebody doesn't bracket their body. Each thing changes into a bare unit of wit, which offers a repose at best. Excellent the applause, excellent the monies, boat-like gliding, coming into peregrination to the point where all of the furnishing and utensils love one out of despair or lie with a filthy laugh. Soon there will be only society and caricature. Monsieur, I am frightened. My friends die. As for the river, the light was the light, the surface imperceptible. Suicides and stories became trees. Was one for the event or on the wrong bridge? We do not pray, the brooder is thinking. The famed impossibility of repetition places itself in relation to the mercantile, hygienic, and military class where those purchasers are honored. Two elements accost one. Both doors remain closed. The historian captures above all a document as if his eye loves. Experiments along these lines, having a degree of luxury sufficient to a certain stage of myth, as in a letter to one's mother, elegantly dressed and rifle in hand, rifle not yet conscious. And what does fashion determine? Fashion determines empathy. When one speaks to flowers, for example, it is an empathy one seeks and offers, as when you offer thinking to a lily and it to you. But now I take a more humble view. Some elements of divinity are simulacra, and any theory of photography has a defeated and retreated feeling, like certain cities one is left. One is not certain if boredom is emotion or philosophy or style, thus its suppleness, whence fluorescence and flower tropes which leads to a kind of material negative as recited on the ancient porches. One's torso swaddles not, only the structure of sex, its boat-like gliding. Whatever records the fabric of the heavens and the earth, whatever cosmopolitan falcon in the inscription splattered panic, in the structure of waiting in epistemological catalogs, erotic problems. One can preserve the appearance of moving to mask an entire incompatibility with the present. An important part of the fabric of love is boredom. And this is not social. It is the necessary repose of the socius. Nothing of machination only the animal infinite, contrapuntal, climbing the morning. What falcon's secular, most pliant tether snaps into dandiacal utterance until the bells ring queasily. In love, one perceives directly, using one's hormones and one's stupidity, one's trifles, that is transcendence intact, rigorous in the decoration of all belief, as if sequestered in a hotel, hotel of the decor of precious origins. One slips all of one's desire into the small silken pocket deep in the cummerbund, 
but leaves them there, tuxedos. And this is fragility, taking leave of itself, monsieur. Can we awake from the century already or only cast over it propositions about the political as if to rescue ourselves? Further to cosmology as the hawk shat, who can say what commodity is if not the capacity to admit chance with no admonishment, said the dog repeatedly in a pattern. What one thinks of the cosmos is nothing, contra the misuse of the present and the texture of waiting. Sift ad hoc time or curse it. One seems to understand scale, I mean in the cosmological sense, only ever in relation to chance. Simply to scaffold being, in multiple frames of probability, then swag it in heavy drapes? Was that the timely choral work? Or rather that the question of time sat on the surface of language and laughed when I tried to face it, and laughed when I tried to face it. To turn from this institution in the position of not believing, this would be the utopian turn. I can't do it. So I pierce utopia with divine boredom. And then the dog, for it was a dog who spoke, gently ambled off betwixt black trunks of trees. And I'm going to tell you that this dog glanced back in simple sadness, said, soon there will only be society. <laughs>